My name is Robert Stoner. I'm the dep or rather, <laughs> I'm the director of the MIT Energy Initiative. I used to be the deputy director, and so by force of habit, I was about to say that I was the deputy director for 10 years for science and technology of the MIT Energy Initiative. And, and a longtime friend of, of Vladimir Bulovich, uh, and I'm delighted to be here with you. When Vladimir first explained the concept of this conference to me, of course, I doubted him. Um, because it was apparent to me that nanotechnology has nothing to do with energy, uh, having not thought about it very deeply in the previous 10 years. But as I thought about it, I began to realize that uh, perhaps, perhaps there was an opportunity here. But what MITEI really does is focus on the energy system as a whole, all aspects of it, technology, policy, public outreach, the economics of the transition, the systems aspects of the transition. How are we going to get from where we are, the mostly fossil fuel powered energy system to one in which we're relying on the sun and the wind, possibly fusion reactors, nuclear reactors of different kinds, batteries, we're relying on policy to drive the transition right now to a large degree. Policy in the form of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is subsidizing the deployment of solar and wind to a very large degree, as well as many other renewable technologies. And the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which has nothing to do with bipartisanship, but, but is providing funds through the Department of Energy for technology demonstrations all over the United States in clusters and in standalone applications. And what we're trying to do is produce carbon dioxide carrying infrastructure and capturing infrastructure and the ability to sequester carbon dioxide uh, either temporarily before we figure out how to use it or permanently in geological storage. And, and also to a large extent, we're trying to produce hydrogen and create a hydrogen economy whatever that might be. And we're hoping that applications emerge apace to enable that economy to come about. So these are big things. And, and it, it, it's, a, it's a tendency we all have to think about energy technology, therefore, as very macro stuff. But if you do think about it, Vladimir is actually our largest recipient of grant support from the MIT Energy Initiative over the years, along with his longtime collaborator, Muji Bowendi, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year for his work on quantum dots. We direct a very large amount of our funding to uh, technologies that use thin films and microstructures in the way Vladimir and Munji do, and to many other things that require nanotechnology either to prepare surfaces or manipulate molecules or enable chemical reactions to take place in three dimensions in bulk chemical reactors to create fuels, to do things with that hydrogen and CO2 that we're learning how to develop with the funding from the IRA and BIL. And so today we're going to talk about those things with, with three uh, colleagues from, from different parts of MIT. First, Ariel First, uh, who's first? Uh, so come on up as I call your names. Um, Ariel is the... Uh, Paul M. Cook, career development professor in chemical engineering, and she's so talented and prolific, I thought she was a full professor uh, until a couple of days ago. So welcome, Ariel, and have a seat. Um, second is Yogi Surendranath, who is an associate professor uh, and equally prolific member of the chemical engineering department. Welcome, Yogi. And third, Kripa Varanasi, uh, an incredibly inventive and thoughtful member of the mechanical engineering department. Uh, whose work spans uh, multiple industries uh, and, and uh, has translated into several companies over the last years, or over the last several years. And so he's also a prolific entrepreneur. And I'm going to keep on talking until I get that microphone attached to his uh, lapel and he can make his way up. Welcome, Kripa. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to organize this, this session as a series of three 10 minute talks. And then uh, I'll have a couple of questions, and then I'd like to throw it open to questions from you. So, so please keep your questions coming via the system, and we'll be keeping a close eye on them. So without further ado, uh, first, you're first. Thank you. So 
My lab looks at interfaces for energy and sustainability, specifically with the lens through biology. I'm not gonna go into any specifics, but I just kind of wanted to get everybody's curiosity going with some of the applications we can uh, use biology for. Maybe, nope, oh. okay. There we go. So before I get into the specifics, I wanted to thank my team. Um, I have an incredible group of postdocs and grad students, as well as, if you'll notice here, undergrads. Uh, that's one of the most fantastic resources of MIT. And as Vladimir and I were talking about yesterday, it's amazing that they're able to go into MIT Nano with my grad students to do the imaging and the processing that we do. So now I'm gonna make sure everybody's awake. Does anybody know? what this is. You gotta say it louder. Velcro, excellent. So did you know that Velcro was actually inspired by the interaction between seed coatings and animal fur? You can see on the top here that this is armor from 1500s AD, inspired by pangolin. And how about this guy? Excellent, I heard it, shark skin. So this is an image of shark skin, and this is an image of swimsuit material from the last Olympics that was meant to mimic it. So pretty much wherever we look, we can see technologies that have been inspired by biology. And so in my lab, we like to either use biology or use its lessons to develop new technologies. So the first one uh, that I'd like to tell you about is engineering microbial surfaces to degrade pollutants. So the way we do this is we can tell microbes to actually put proteins on their surface, and then we can kill the microbes, so we have very inexpensive biomaterials. We can use these proteins that we put on the surface for everything, from PFAS degradation and microplastic degradation to rare earth element recovery and lithium recovery. So this is a fantastic, inexpensive technology to both degrade environmental contaminants into inert uh, components, as well as recover valuable components of very caustic um, matrices. And we can see this on the right. Uh, so this was some work that was actually done by high schoolers in our lab this summer. We have our microbes that don't have any special treatment, and then we have our microbes that we've put proteins on the surface of. You can see that after just 24 hours, this chunk of plastic, obviously nothing happens. But you can see here that more than 50% of that weight has been degraded. And what we find is that this is actually degraded into the monomers. So we can take this plastic and recycle it back into virgin plastic, effectively circularizing the plastic economy. The next technology, which some of you heard a little bit about yesterday, is nanoscale suits of armor to protect microbes. So these suits of armor are about 10 nanometers thick, they self-assemble on the surface of microbes, and they protect them from a variety of stressors. The most important part here is they're incredibly easy to form. That video of that blue color is the coating forming on the microbes. And we have a wide range of applications for this. We can do everything from enable vaccine delivery by enabling the transport of things like the tuberculosis vaccine at room temperature without needing fridges or freezers, we can develop new technologies for regenerative agriculture, where we get higher seed germination in the presence of these coated microbes. For CO2 sequestration, we can incorporate these microbes into cement for self-healing cement that both requires less person power to produce and also sequesters CO2 in the atmosphere in the form of calcium carbonate. We can also use these coatings for green synthesis so we can make nanoparticles for catalysis using microbes in water. And we can do aerobic radical polymerization with highly controlled size dispersity. Last technology I'm gonna talk about, and I know I've flown through these, so if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end or after the session. But the last one is using biomolecules to actually control nanoparticle synthesis. And I should say here that all the beautiful images I've shown of electron microscopy of our microbes and our particles were done in MIT Nano. So thank you, Vladimir. We can control the shape of these nanoparticles by, as my students like to call it, cooking in the lab. By controlling the sugar and the salt that's used to synthesize these, we can control 
the three-dimensional shape, getting everything from these jacks to these cubes to these almost two-dimensional triangles. And we can use these for CO2 reduction, electrocatalysis, so turning CO2 into other things by basically adding electrons to it. And we can actually control what products we get out of it based on the shape of those particles. So by simply changing the ingredients that we use to make these particles, we can actually change how they react and generate everything from carbon monoxide, effectively syngas, to ethylene, a precursor for many polymers and jet fuel. So I hope what I've shown you today is the power of biology and biomolecules uh, to enable nanotechnologies for clean energy. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Keep those questions coming. Well, uh, this is correct, yes. Well, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to speak here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on the, on the fifth anniversary of MIT Nano because uh, much of my, uh, my early career and the work I'm going to show you was really facilitated by the facilities here. And um, you know, I want to begin because our group really focuses on, on the nano design of interfaces, uh, much the same way that Ariel spoke about. Um, and you know, there's a famous quote from John Goodenough that the interface is the device. Um, and in many devices for energy conversion technologies, uh, that really is true. Um, and I would argue that the way we nanostructure an interface is central to whether the device operates efficiently or not efficiently. In fact, the, the batteries that all of you are carrying around in your pockets right now have highly nano-engineered interfaces. And that's what allows the charge transfer reactions at those interfaces to work efficiently and selectively. It determines how durable your battery is. It determines whether it degrades. It determines the energy storage density of that. What I'm going to tell you about is that you can even use the nanostructuring interface to control the reaction outcomes that occur at those interfaces and actually design those in a very rational way. Um, I want to thank the people that, that did this work, a lot of phenomenal graduate students and postdocs who contributed to this effort over the, over the years, and, and of course, the, the MIT nano facilities that were critical to, to a lot of this work. Um, so the problem we were interested in, the problem we've been interested in for quite some time, is how you take renewable electricity and use it to drive the conversion of carbon dioxide into a fuel. Um, we, as, 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 as Rob, Rob, Rob mentioned, there's technologies that exist right now for electrolysis of water to make hydrogen, and some of that is practiced industrially, and there are demonstration projects out there to be able to actually develop this at scale, but we don't have con, uh, commensurate technologies for being able to directly convert CO2 into a fuel. Um, and, and that's the technology that we want to be able to develop, to be able to figure out how to engineer an interface in just the right way, with just the right degree of nanostructure, to be able to control the selectivity of CO2 conversion to one product over another, um, while, while not having competing reactions that you don't want to have happen. So how do we go about doing this? Right? So, um, the key, really, to CO2 conversion to fuels is all about selectivity. So let me just kind of show you this on, an, on a thermodynamic number line, right? So this number line is the potential necessary to drive a given chemical reaction. You can think of this very similar to the potentials that are used in your battery to do the anode and cathode reaction. Here we're doing simply the conversion of CO2 to, say, a fuel like ethanol. It turns out, though, that at the very same potentials where this occurs thermodynamically, you can actually carry out a much simpler reaction, which is the reduction of protons to hydrogen. And it even turns out that you can carry out a whole host of other reactions. For example, the production of syngas, formate, you know, methane or ethylene, for example, all over a very similar narrow window of thermodynamic energy. So the question is, how do you select between all of these? How do you do one reaction over the other? And what I'm going to convince you in the next little while is that that all comes down to how you nano-engineer the interface. Um, so we wanted to ask this question. The question we were, we were particularly focused on is how do you select for a CO2 conversion reaction versus the kinetically more facile reaction of converting protons to hydrogen? Right, the reaction you don't want to do if you're trying to convert CO2 to a fuel. Right? And so this really comes down to a question of what the, are the kinetic branch points. Now I'm skipping through really uh, several PhD theses of work here, um, um, but I want to show you what we learned. What we learned really was that the mechanism by which metal surfaces catalyze CO2 reduction is gated by a critical step 
that involves the binding of CO2 to the metal surface with the concomitant transfer of an electron. What we found out was that this was very different than the competing evolution of hydrogen, which involved the reaction of proton with the surface. And because one reaction was insensitive to the proton environment and the other reaction was, it automatically told us what the design principle was for being able to select for one reaction over the other. And the idea was, could we use a nano-engineered interface to create a local environment at the catalyst surface that was rich in CO2, but depleted in proton? If we could do that, this very simple mechanistic picture would already tell us that we would be able to encourage selectivity for one reaction over the other. And so we did that. So, so we basically used a strategy that involves templating of, of porous nanostructured metals using a strategy called inverse opal templating. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty simple and scalable strategy that involves basically using polystyrene fear, spheres that you assemble into an opal type structure. Um, here's actually an image of that um, uh, showing the sort of ordered array you can get with these spheres. Then what you do is simply come in with an electrodeposition to be able to generate metal catalysts inside of these pores. Then you can simply remove the template. Um, to be able to generate a very well-defined porous structure with tunable aperture sizes and cavity sizes that are on the nanometer length scale. And by doing that, what we were able to actually show was that you could, here's some images actually of this, a sort of very ordered array of these structures, both on uh, a z-axis as well as top down. And we could actually show that as you systematically varied the thickness and aspect ratio of these materials, you would actually inhibit the rate of, CO, of proton reduction to hydrogen while promoting the rate of CO2 to CO conversion. And the consequence of all of this is that we could actually simply by controlling nanostructure, actually systematically walk the selectivity of, in this case, a syngas production reaction all the way from nominally 0% up to 80% CO in the balance. So what this really illustrated to us is that there's a grand future in being able to design catalysts in a systematic way through thinking about how the nanostructure imposes a specific microenvironment the catalyst primed for the reaction of interest. And this is really the same thing that's happening in the batteries that are in your pockets right now, just for a far more complicated set of chemical reactions. We actually figured out a lot about how this actually happens. What, we, what, we, what I want to just conclude on it by saying is that there's a rich opportunity to be able to use CO2 as a resource to meet diverse needs in chemicals, materials, and fu fuels. And really, all of this boils down to how you nano-design an interface to be able to engage selective CO2 conversion. Um, and there's a huge opportunity in this space. Happy to take more questions. I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Uh, so, um, so yeah, like I was saying, I had the uh, good fortune to work on uh, many things uh, over the past several years, and uh, I hope I don't shoot this in someone's eyes. Uh, so, um, and it has allowed us to work across, you know, from starting from power generation, where we worked on thermal fluids, and more recently on CO2 conversion uh, and uh, capture and conversion. Uh, and uh, in the water space as well as ag space. And uh, we've been fortunate to form some, some of these companies over the years. Uh, you might have read about Liquid Glide where we are able to evacuate every last drop of product all the way to uh, more recently a company in agriculture. So today I want to talk about uh, some of the work we are doing on CO2 uh, capture and conversion, but thinking about this at scale. So uh, given uh, this is probably a chart that most of you might have seen, uh, given uh, the um, amount of CO2 that's out there, uh, we need to do both uh, sort of point source capture as well as uh, negative emission technologies where we are actively taking CO2 out of, uh, out of the atmosphere. And uh, um, so if we kind of look at the cost uh, basis here, in terms of doing capture, is uh, turns out to be more of a capex a related issue, whereas going from uh, there to conversion, where you're doing extraction and conversion, uh, takes two steps. And what we've been trying to do is both uh, do integrated capture and conversion, while also reduce uh, the uh, capex related to this uh, capex, uh, the capture step. 
And so, uh, so uh, depending on the time, I'm going to see if I can tell you about what we are doing on efficient capture, but also on, on conversion. Uh, this is something that probably most of you have seen. This is the mean capture tower, where the solubility of CO2 is pretty high, but uh, you still have issues in terms of the capex. Uh, and you, when you look at the size of these towers, they are huge. They are the size of the Prudential Tower. And so the question is, you know, there's still sort of a mass transport limitation here. And when we sort of dug into this, uh, what we find is, so this is the example of the Petronova Tower, which costs about $500 million. A significant capex event uh, was had to be shut down uh, because uh, you know oil prices crashed and, and so on. But uh, um, but the but the issue at hand is why do you need such a long large tower? And so when you look at some of the um, uh, mass transport calculations, what you find is that the film thickness of the sorbent here tends to be in the hundreds of microns. So if you're able to sort of change that and make it into fine mist, for example where you can significantly increase the interfacial area, you should drastically sort of reduce the, uh, the size of these, uh, these units. And so uh, the question was, yes, so this could be done, and uh, why was this not done so far? It, because these fine mists can get entrained and can also uh, exit as emissions. So, uh, but uh, fortunately, a few years ago, uh, actually in the MIT Energy Initiative in the Tata Center, we developed a, a project where we were capturing plumes from cooling towers. So this is an exa a lab scale setup where uh, when we switch on the electric field, you'll see that the plume that's there uh, is captured and we are able to you know, take that and uh, collect it in that beaker there. So using some, some of these technologies where we are injecting charge and we are electrifying this plume, uh, we've done something similar with uh, CO2-laden mists and uh, we are able to show that we can also capture these, uh, these now uh, dissolved CO2 mists uh, in, in these systems. And we are able to get down to 99, there it's 95, but 99% uh, capture efficiency. So what are the implications of these? The implications of these are that now we can take some of these absorber towers and significantly scale them down uh, because uh, we, can red we can both increase the interfacial area and uh, shrink the size and capex and opex for these systems and also move towards uh, less toxic uh, solvents. And this is also an issue with DAC processes where 60% of the capex cost uh, there you know, comes a significant amount of that of the capex is the absorber cost and also on the opex uh, side so uh, we 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 uh, believe that these systems could also very well integrate with dac systems and we have done this for scale for cooling towers uh, this is a uh, example where we have been able to deploy this on a uh, mit cooling tower to capture the plumes and this is at a 1000 megawatt facility uh, where uh, this is now commercially deployed so uh, we can use these uh, to and translate the, uh, what we are finding on the CO2 capture space uh, at scale. Another technology I'll talk about is uh, capturing or removing CO2 from ocean waters, where, uh, uh, where I'm collaborating with Professor Alan Hatton, who is uh, both an amazing, amazing uh, researcher as well as friend, and uh, we've been having a lot of fun with this, pro uh, with this project. Uh, the idea here is that the oceans, about 30% of the CO2 partitions uh, into the oceans, and now the concentration of CO2 in the oceans is about 100 times that of air, and therefore lower volumes need to be processed and the capture step is uh, kind of done for you. And so the uh, interesting thing here is in the uh, way the uh, CO2 gets absorbed into oceans and you get, uh, you acidify the oceans in a carbonic acid, and this reaction here, which where the CO2 now speciates as bicarbonate and carbonate ions, is controlled by the proton concentration. So you can now decrease the pH and reverse this reaction and release CO2, or increase the pH and actually precipitate out the carbonate ions uh, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the system. So what are the impacts of this, of seawater acidification? Right? It's, it's uh, a major problem because it is driving uh, the pH down and is causing things like corals and others to disappear. Uh, and you also have shellfish that are having problems. For example, in Washington State, a lot of these oyster farms, all of the oysters uh, died in 20, uh, in, you know, have, been, have been significantly, uh, they, they're not been having significant yields. And so that's impacting a lot of things. So here, 
uh, is what we do in this process. So we take the ocean water and we acidify one of the cells, remove the CO2, and we realkalize and we are able to uh, put it back. Now this alkalized uh, water can then be used for uh, controlling the pH locally as well in, in these uh, environments. Um, and so what we have here, because this has no uh, membranes and it is uh, uh, basic, no membranes and no chemicals that are used, uh, and it's all driven uh, by these electroactive materials purely electrochemically, we have one of the best energetics uh, that's out there, uh, about 2.6 gigatons, uh, gigajoules per ton of CO2, 120 joules, 120 kilojoules per mole, and uh, also costs that are around, just including the electrochemical pumping costs, we are about 50 to 60 uh, dollars per ton of CO2. And if I take a moment here to look at the challenge there, which was you have to remove 10 gigatons of CO2 uh, per year till 2050, uh, you're looking at, if you're going to 2050 and you're looking at um, uh, these negative emission technologies taking over, for a giga uh, ton of CO2 removal, we estimate uh, about six ships worth of, uh, 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 worth of the shipping containers that can actually do that job. So it is completely tractable and scalable uh, as we kind of see it. Uh, so this, these could be deployed, for example, on uh, uh, offshore platforms to ships. Uh, and this is, an, this is way how the uh, ocean acidification is dramatically impacting marine life. So this is late 1800s where CO2 concentration was low. You had enough carbonate ions for these shellfish to form shells, et cetera. But now with this high concentration, uh, you know, a lot of that is going towards bicarbonate formation. And so we can now reverse this and we can control this. Uh, these are examples as of today, you know, uh, what happened, for example, uh, this shellfish industry uh, here is uh, getting impacted because of the, uh, the, the aragonite supersaturation actually in, the, uh, in this Gulf of Maine is dropping, and so they have to do special things to control the uh, pH. And as I said, uh, the example with the, uh, with the oyster farms here, you know, one year that's completely sort of disappeared. Um, I think I have like one minute, so. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Yogi talked about this quite a bit, uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll spare you the background, and uh, uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for that, Yogi. This, your talk was awesome, by the way, <laughs> in explaining that. Um, so one of the things, as we were thinking about scale here, was that as we want to go to, uh, go to uh, this reduction reaction, as Yogi had talked about, to be able to make something uh, possible, and we were looking at ethylene because it has both a big market and it has uh, one of the largest uh, CO2 emissions, you need to be able to get to uh, pretty large current densities on the order of uh, amps per centimeter square or, or more. And so the question was how do we kind of get there? And one of the issues, uh, as uh, Yogi also mentioned, mass transport and other uh, issues play an important role. And so one of the things that has uh, come up here is uh, the, um, uh, the use of a gas diffusion electrode. And uh, the, one of the challenge here has been conductivity versus hydrophobicity of these electrodes. So if you, you don't want this electrode to be flooded because then you come back with the same issues of mass transfer. At the same time, you want it also to be conductive. And so when you make it into a system like this, your conductivity uh, suffers if you have a, a re really high hydrophobic membranes. Or if you go to these carbon electrodes, you have high conductivity, but you lose on the uh, hydrophobic properties and you get flooding. So we were focused on how to kind of beat this. And uh, we came up with a way to uh, take these systems and uh, hierarchically create these uh, uh, structures that are enable it to be both conductive and also uh, enable it to uh, be flooding resistant. And that uh, allows us to then also control uh, the kind of, uh, uh, give us flexibility in ter terms of the selectivity as well, which I'll not be able to go through today. But we've been able to show uh, 90 plus percent C2 Faradaic efficiency, and we've been able to show that at scale, uh, and we've been able to scale it up from a lab scale to 10 times here, only limited by the amount of current we can draw uh, in, our, uh, in our lab. So at the moment, we are somewhere here, and we hope to uh, kind of move this technology to make it uh, industrially uh, relevant. Um, so I'll pause uh, there, because I think I'm over time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and do keep your questions coming. But, but let me start with a sort of an observation. 
the observation is that one way or another, you're, you're all three kind of going between two-dimensional phenomena or interfacial phenomena and three-dimensional phenomena. And in your case, Ariel, you're talking about bugs and biomimetic particles or, 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 or molecules. Um, and it seems to me that I mean, a, a three-dimensional thing happens much more efficiently than a two-dimensional process, I mean, not a thing. And, and uh, Kripa, I think your, your demonstration of the amine absorption system, yeah. you know, b b shrinking dramatically when you start spraying rather than trying to use just surfaces to, to condense things. Um, does, it, does it mean that there's a... I mean, your, your work, Yogi, was, you were talking about two-dimensional things, and I know you've done a lot of two-dimensional stuff as well. But, but are, the, are, the, are we stuck with the limitations that, that we end up with, with a, a, a mass transfer or the accumulation of reactants at interfaces that, that you have to somehow deal with in some way? Or can we, can we three-dimensionalize all of these processes one way or another and shrink them? I don't know who that question is for. I mean, but Maybe I can speak a little bit to it. So, so you know, the, the long-standing view in particularly electrochemical technologies has been the challenges around this issue of 2D scaling, right? Um, that, that when you have, a, uh, say, a volume reactor doing something, you can simply scale it in a three-dimensional fashion by making the reactor bigger. When you want to take a two-dimensional system and scale it, it involves sort of more repeat units of the same two-dimensional interface or more of them stacked together. Now, this is not a deal breaker. It, in some cases, can be an advantage because it means that the, the devices become scale independent in terms of their cost curve with scale. It means that doing things in a more modular, distributed fashion are sometimes easier at nanoscale two-dimensional interfaces than they are in large-scale heat-integrated three-dimensional reactors. That being said, I think that a lot of the nanoengineering approaches are to ask yourself, how can you best create three-dimensional hierarchy within what is ostensibly a two-dimensional interface. So it may be macroscopically two-dimensional, but it's very three-dimensional in its nano environment. Um, and that's the way you, you try to balance those two to be able to maximize uh, limitations on transport, conductivity, et cetera. Anyone else want to take a swing at that? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with what Yogi mentioned. Uh, I think, um, yeah, a lot of these processes we want to uh, by doing surface engineering or others, you can impart, uh, you can scale that. But I think in the case of the uh, gas evolving kind of systems, what we are finding is something that's actually ag goes against the uh, conventional wisdom of increasing surface area because of the passivation that you end up getting. So I think clever architectures that allow you to, um, yeah, allow you to kind of overcome those would would help, but uh, but yeah, I think I think maybe you can combine two-dimensional stuff with three-dimensional things. For example, we are doing something like that in lithium extraction by combining thermal processes with electrochemical processes. So there is there is some uh, advantage there when you do that. Right. I mean, that's I think that's right. Ariel, you're nodding. Did you? fully agree with all that or you do want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I think biology does that really well when we think about everything that cells have on their membrane. It's effectively a two-dimensional system that's wrapped around a three-dimensional, right? So you effectively have your kind of surface area to volume optimized based on four billion years of evolution. So one thing that biology doesn't do well is um, survive. <laughs> I mean, particularly handmade bugs of the sort that you're using, when you're using, for example, to, to consume plastic and turn them into plastic precursors yeah. so that we can make more plastic uh, and circulate it, which yeah. is a good thing. I mean, you're competing w with, with other bugs for nutrients and space and processes. I mean, and so the, the knock against biofuels is always well types win. And, yeah. and these specialized bugs that can be more efficient briefly don't make it, and we end up with low yield processes no matter what we do. Is, is that true in your case? Are you having to very carefully separate the plastic from the municipal solid waste, for example, that you might find it in? Or, or are these really robust bugs that you've got? So these are actually very delicate bugs, but we intentionally kill them before we use them. So we just need the proteins to be active. Ah, okay. So we, we use the bugs as a three-dimensional scaffold for the enzymes because usually the cost associated with using protein-based materials is the isolation and purification of the protein. 
So we skip all that. You see, and the proteins are robust. Yes, they, they're very robust, and actually their two-dimensional packing on the surface makes them even more stable. So we can actually heat those microbes, the dead microbes that degrade plastic up to 80 degrees Celsius, and that's where they're most efficient, which is something you couldn't do with the live I see. organism. So you've, you have an easy pathway to three-dimensionality. We do. And, and bulk. Yes. And we can make it for about $10 for 100 grams. So there's a question here that I don't fully understand. It says, how much energy is required for the CAPEX processes? That bigger. And does the CO2 removal offset the net amount of energy needed? Are you able, I think that question might be for you, Kripa. Are you able to interpret? What I was trying to say there was for the, um, for the capture process, you, it's, it's energetically favorable, but it's mostly driven by CAPEX. And so by doing the things I was talking about, you can shrink that. And then after the CO2 is captured, you need to be able to then extract it to do something with it. And right now it is done in two steps. You have extraction and then conversion. And if you're able to do that simultaneously, then you shrink, you cut the, both the energy, because the extraction and conversion has, is both CapEx and energy gain. So if you're able to combine them, you can shrink that. And I was, sh I was showing that you could roughly half that or maybe even bring that down. Is that on a path of commercialization? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Keep, keep them coming. I, I started to ask one of you, Yogi, initially about your... Where does the light come? You had a title that said solar fuels, and I never, I never saw any photons. Yeah, so I, I think that the, 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 the way we approach this problem was that the nanoengineering challenge begins first with how to control the reaction chemistry and the chemical branch points. With the picture that even if the solar photons were ultimately what were to drive the reducing and oxidizing equivalents, the chemical pathways would still be the native chemical pathways given by the nanostructured interfaces. So, so I would say that you know an integrated system that integrates light capture with conversion uh, will simply adopt sort of the principles we brought to bear, um, but it needs to have more integration of how you then efficiently generate excited charge carriers, move them to where they need to be, and then do the, do the chemistry. But you can't start to engineer that without knowing what the interfacial chemistry is. Yeah, that's, that's how we think about the problem. Yeah. So here's a very broad question. Um, and it, I'm trying to, in a sense, relate the, the topic of nanotechnology to energy. But you know, much of what goes on in, in, in um, the, the uh, nano facility is creating structures, and, and that requires capabilities, capabilities to etch or pattern, for example, or, or reduce things in size. Are there capabilities that uh, are lacking, and, and that if you had them, would enable you to do things that we're not yet able to do? Is that? <laughs> well, I, I, I would go one step further, right? I, I think that MIT Nano, at MIT in particular, has played an immense role not only in facilitating our ability to make nanostructures, but also to understand what's happening at nanostructures through advanced imaging capabilities. And there's been a recent growth of the appreciation that a nanostructured interface is different when it's under the exotic conditions where it's doing a reaction, carrying out a conversion, than it is when it's prepared, for example. And, and I, I see a lot of the future of MIT Nano and, and the science of, of nano in general uh, around the question of asking how do nanostructures evolve and change under the conditions that are relevant to their function, um, which is not always the conditions that are the same as when they're produced. Um, uh, but that's ultimately what matters when, when you're using them in a, in a functional device or using them over long term. You want to figure out how they change. And, and the tools at MIT Nano, operando tools in particular, can help us sort that out and figure out where are the choke points, where do certain interfaces break down, where do they reform, and that's the science that, that honestly has, has had a huge impact on the battery science area and, and will have a huge impact on and interface of sciences in, in many of these other areas too. Anyone else want to comment on that? Or? I mean, I, I think that's very well said. Uh, <laughs> I think what, one, one point I might add is, um, you know, to understand, so when you go commercial, right, like you take, take battery electrodes, you're mixing different powders, et cetera, and you're putting this down. You actually don't know, don't, you don't systematically maybe control structure. And I think, uh, in, at least in my work, 
uh, even with liquid glide work, for example, ultimately we spray some things, uh, and that gives us that structure. But to get down to what matters and what lens scales matter, we need to be able to make those structures that are, you know, where we can systematically study the effects of these things. And in that sense, you know, a lot of that work uh, was done at uh, MIT Nano, MTL, uh, and essentially allowed us to then map out and create those phase diagrams using which now you can scale up and manufacture so that you are, you know, you are at the scale that matters. So I think in that sense, this is, it has been, it has been a big boon and it was very crucial for, for development of the science and then translation uh, of those. So that's, that's characterization technology in, in, in both cases that you're studying. But also fabrication. I guess so. To be able yeah. to fabricate things that making small things. But what about the integration of microelectronics with uh, processes, chemical processes, biological processes, um, in ways that might change them? Is that is that a, a direction anyone is going in 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 the field? Um, we we are. Um, well, what yes. a question. <laughs> so so um, we're actually collaborating with Tim Swagger's lab. That they've made some pretty simple RFID based chemi resistors. So you can basically use commercial RFID tags um, to do on off switching. And we are making them into bio resistors uh, by using microbes that can generate electricity. I see. Okay. So there we are. We're on our way. And there's one more question. <laughs> Um, what were the challenges in carbon dioxide electrolysis for large-scale and industrial applications compared to water splitting and hydrogen evolution reactions? Let me read that again. What would be the challenges in carbon dioxide electrolysis for large-scale and industrial applications compared to water splitting and hydrogen evolution reactions? I'll field it. <laughs> um, so there, there are many challenges, right? Um, the, the conventional pathway you could think about is doing water splitting, generating hydrogen, and then doing a thermochemical conversion of that hydrogen and CO2. Unfortunately, those thermochemical processes are often very constrained by the simple thermodynamics of the reaction. That's the reason people are very interested in electrochemical technologies that do direct electrolysis. And the reason for that is very simple. It's simply that hydrogen isn't that strong of a reducing agent. Um, it's in fact thermodynamically uphill to, to take hydrogen, react it with CO2, and, and convert it to even syngas, for example, right? Um, not to mention the selectivity challenges that accrue from that. Um, so while there are many challenges in sort of developing that technology and scaling that technology, um, I think there are a lot of opportunities relative to sort of conventional processing where you're thinking about generating hydrogen and do, using sort of conventional um, petrochemical industry processing to be able to convert CO2. M most of the chemical industry is around breaking down um, biogenic, if you will, historically or uh, geologically generated biogenic molecules into fuels. It hasn't been around taking energy poor substrates like CO2 and converting them into fuels. Uh, but that's really the frontier challenge, and, and uh, electrochemical conversions offer a large opportunity if we can solve many of these challenges around scale. Uh, that, that, that are still uh, important to solve, and, and we're making progress in, but we, we haven't made full progress in yet. Yeah. But you've been working lately on, on um, manipulating surfaces in, in such ways to increase the area that's available for reactions. And you've done it in a couple of, couple of fields, but particularly in, in hydrogen production recently. Mm -hmm. Could you just sort of dis describe that a little bit, because I think it relates to all these ideas. Yeah, I think what we are trying to do, Rob, is um, in, in the water electrolysis uh, domain, uh, like just to give you a, uh, give you a number, uh, today, like 2021, 95 megatons of hydrogen were produced, and you have produced about 850 megatons of CO2 that goes with it. So it's a scale of 10x, right? And so if you want to go to green hydrogen, uh, a big cost is the electricity cost, and that's coming up to uh, you know, anywhere from six plus, three plus to six dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. It's a goal is to get to a kilogram uh, of hydrogen, a kilo, dollar per kilogram of hydrogen. And so to be able to do that, we are trying to um, make the electrolyte, looking at it at system level, we see membranes playing a big role, so we are trying to get rid of membranes. And as I said, uh, in a gas evolving electrode, basically these bubbles that are forming, are essentially passivating the whole electrode area. So in fact, the denser uh, or high surface area uh, uh, surfaces that are there are actually leading to poor performance. So if you are able to judiciously place the 
catalyst material so that you have both bubble evolution that helps you and also saves you on the cost of these expensive uh, catalyst materials. You can then really build an electrolyzer where you can now bring uh, these electrodes closer. We can reduce the amount of material use and slowly kind of get towards that dollar per kilogram. Another thing we are starting to think about is geological hydrogen, which uh, I think uh, uh, both Yogi is also working on. Uh, and that's kind of we're doing uh, reactions uh, at a uh, source rock level and extracting and uh, extracting hydrogen from there, where there's merits to go up to a dollar per kilogram. Ariel, um, you're doing something really novel, which I had great doubts about initially, but I've come to understand a little bit, which is to use DNA as a scaffolding, mm -hmm. uh, sort of in the way Kripa is talking about creating structure for reactions to occur at, it makes them more efficient. Can you can talk a little bit about that and what, what, what sort of applications you found for DNA? Yeah, so um, we basically use DNA as a molecular Velcro. So if you think about Velcro and the electrostatics that allow it to stick together, the hydrogen bonding between complementary DNA strands, if everybody thinks back to ninth grade biology, uh, work pretty similarly. And we've been able to significantly improve um, CO2 reduction efficiency. Uh, we think basically because of the nano environment. So we approach the challenge of making two-dimensional surfaces more three-dimensional, uh, kind of in the inverse of Yogi. So instead of etching things away, we're adding things in a co very controlled way using this DNA. Um, and what that's resulted in is we can get about four times the Faradayic efficiency for carbon monoxide production using about 30% less energy input. Um, so is that going in a commercial direction? or is uh, We are hoping. We actually have a team in Climate and Energy Ventures class working on it right now, a business model for it. Great, OK. Yeah. For everyone's information, Climate and Energy Ventures class was created by um, my former colleague in the MIT Energy Initiative, Frankie O'Sullivan, who still teaches it, I think, as a senior lecturer as a hobby. He actually has a real job. Uh, and this has been a very prolific source of um, energy-related uh, new ventures. Um, and, and so it's interesting to hear that you have one in there. I have one in there this year. Do you guys have <laughs> any in there, or do you work through that class? I've worked with them in the past, yeah. yeah. Kripa, are, are, you, are you involved at all with Energy Ventures? Energy, yeah, in the past. Yeah. In the past, okay. Um, well, I think we've sort of reached the end of our time, unless there are any, oh, there's another question from the audience. Okay, great. So this is our last question. When did, whoa. When design functional structural materials, when design, designing perhaps, functional structural materials, how do you balance between biomimicking and bioinspiration? That's an aerial question. <laughs> yes. Um, so I would say we think of it in two different buckets, which is using biology, and then we think of biomimicry and bioinspiration kind of as the second bucket, which is are materials we can make better than what biology makes, or is biology better at what it can do. Um, and I think depending, a lot of it depends on the operating parameters of it. So, you know, biology has very specific parameters. It doesn't really like to operate outside of water and at very high or very low temperatures. So that, I think, drives a lot of our decision making. Um, but, you know, I mentioned this here, and this is how I convince students that think they want to go into straight catalysis work to come work on microbes in my lab, which is, Microbes are like tiny little chemical factories that have had four billion years of evolution to be as efficient as they can possibly be. So basically, you have a four billion year head start on your PhD if you use what biology has already given you. It's what everybody needs. <laughs> okay, well I think we've done it. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your incredibly interesting work and descriptions of it and thoughts. Uh, and thank you for listening and participating. Back to you, Brother.